Good afternoon to everyone in the land of Zoom, and welcome to the Board of Health virtual meeting on Thursday, July 22nd, scheduled for 4 p.m. My name is Thomas Corey. Present with me via Zoom is Michael Coughlin and Tess Curran, our agent for the board, Mr. Paul Furlan, the administrator of the Community Utilities. We are awaiting Dr. Gagliotti's arrival. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. And for the record, we are not in the city council hearing chambers. All are participating remotely from locations of the known universe. Tess, if you'd please call the roll. Thomas Corey. Present. Michael Coughlin. Present. Our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from the meeting of Thursday, June 24th. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to be made to the minutes of the meeting as printed? Nope. Can we get a motion? Move to approve the minutes. I'll second. We have a roll call. Thomas Corey. Yes. Michael Coughlin. Yes. Okay. Next item, we have the a presentation from Tess Curran, Director of Health and Human Services. If you would, Tess. Great. Thank you. And I am just going to share my screen again. Um, so I just want to kind of preface this by saying this is kind of a high level um, presentation that um, just due to some communities um, in Massachusetts having issues with the PFAS chemicals and the, um, there being a lot of information in the news uh, about these forever chemicals that I thought it would be of value um, for us to just um, have um, Mr. Furland here to talk about what's going on at Fall River. And, and again, there's nothing of concern right now, but again, we just wanted to kind of bring this to light um, and share some background and information um, for the board. Um, and, and again, with that, I am by no means an expert on um, PFAS chemicals. So for there, if there's any kind of uh, deeper dive or questions or concerns that you have um, that you know we can't answer here today, I'd be happy to you know either take those questions back or even potentially have somebody from DPA or Mass DEP come for an expanded presentation if you um, have any additional questions or concerns. So um, just kind of an, an overview. So we'll just kind of go over what they are, common uses, where these chemicals are found, um, exposure, uh, exposures and levels of concern, and then the health impacts as well as kind of the local um, monitoring um, from the, the water department. Um, and again, this can be just an open discussion. So anytime you have any questions or concerns, um, or Paul, if you want to chime in at any time, um, then, then feel free to do so. Um, so these PFAS chemicals, they're, um, they're known as the forever chemicals. They don't biodegrade. Um, they are extremely stable. Um, they're heat and stain resistant and water repellent, which has made them you know, partly why they've been used so frequently, um, and they travel easily in water. Um, so common uses, they're found in uh, things like takeout containers, um, nonstick cookware, um, carpets, um, or any kind of stain resistant treatments or apparel that is um, water or stain resistant, so things like Scotch Guard and, and um, items like that. Um, some household cleaning products or consumer products, even cosmetics. Um, and then, you know, carpets and textiles. Again, I, I wrote that twice. Um, waxes, both for floor, car, and, and skis. Um, and then firefighting foam um, is another. <clears throat> oh. Paul, did you, did you have something to add? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so this is kind of just um, an overview of some opportunities for exposure. So whether it be, um, you know, a chemical plant um, that's utilizing or creating um, any of those chemicals and, and that kind of going into the um, surface water, groundwater, 
um, or any of the materials, um, you know, being directly used by a consumer. Um, and again, the runoff or from those, uh, those um, products. And then again, that firefighting foam not being used and then that going into um, the surface water, groundwater, and, and then going back into humans from um, either water consumption and or food consumption for things like fish or um, you know other animals. So these chemicals were discovered, you know, in drinking water. Um, oftentimes, it's um, found in areas that are near um, airports, um, runways, uh, firefighting training areas, um, or parking lots where fire trucks are being washed. Um, any kind of industrial areas where they're they're manufacturing. Um, PFAS themselves or and or products, you know, um, that are being manufactured. Um, buildings where that um, that particular firefighting foam was used to put out a fire, um, and then other possible sources such as online landfills, um, you know, or waste wastewater. Um, so low, very low levels are of concern for humans, um, which is, you know, really why these have been kind of in the news um, as of late and, and why we're, we're discussing that and, and Paul will go into that in greater detail in terms of Massachusetts. Um, uh, but in Massachusetts, and Paul can expand upon this as well, we do have um, tighter restrictions. So the EPA um, indicates uh, 70 parts per trillion being of concern, but Massachusetts um, has a more strict regulation indicating um, 20 parts per trillion um, would then require action to be taken on the local level. And so again, that just to kind of give a picture of that, um, that's equivalent to um, a single drop of water in 20 Olympic sized pools. So it is um, very small amounts uh, that can make a, an impact. Um, so again, food is a, a primary source for many populations, and a lot of these exposures are when um, drinking water is contaminated um, by a, you know, uh, manufacturing site or something like that. Um, so the impact on human health, um, these chemicals are readily absorbed into the body. Um, they accumulate in um, blood or kidneys um, and liver, um, and they are slowly excreted, excreted from the body, but that takes about um, eight years on average. Um, again, it affects um, the blood, liver, and the immune system, the endocrine disruption, so, you know, thyroid, um, hormones, um, developmental risk for, you know, infants and um, for women who are pregnant, um, and then there's possibly links to cancers. Um, so again, consumption of, of water with PFAS chemicals um, you know, doesn't directly mean um, that these um, health concerns will occur. Um, it certainly depends on levels um, and duration of exposure, and then the kind of um, the EPA, from my understanding, is looking at lifetime exposure, um, not just one-time um, short-term exposure. Um, however, like most things, um, short-term exposure for sensitive groups like pregnant women or um, women who are nursing, um, the immunocompromised, and then any you know, infants or um, children. Um, so, um, the NAS DEP has kind of updated their regulations over the last several years, again, making them more restrictive. So that you'll see in 2018, there was that 20 parts per trillion um, that was following those EPA guidelines. That over time has become more strict. And now Massachusetts um, has a level of 20 parts per trillion. Um, so, uh, 
some things that that nasty AP is uh, kind of actions that they're taking. They are doing some firefighting foam tape back. So I'm um, trying to get the those materials kind of out of um, out of normal use. Um, identifying other sources and um, opportunities that these chemicals are getting into the water supply. Um, and then they're routinely evaluating the current guidelines that they have um, every three years based on the data that's coming out. Um, and certainly this isn't a problem that's unique to Massachusetts. Um, these chemicals are, um, are everywhere. Um, and so uh, I, I kind of wanted to just uh, that that's kind of my my part of the presentation. Um, but but Paul is here from the water department um, to kind of provide you all with an update as to um, what he's seeing in Fall River, and then answering maybe any questions that you may have. But I'll stop sharing my screen in the meantime. Hi, how's it going, uh, board? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation, uh, Tess. Um, so <clears throat> PFAS, as uh, some of you may know, is essentially an acronym um, for pre uh, fluoro um, either a uh, octane or acid, or there's, there's multiple different ones. Uh, as it's been determined, and uh, in, in Massachusetts, we, we, we call it PFAS-6 because there are six uh, different substances within that category. Uh, that the that the state feels are harmful and need to be regulated. Uh, as uh, as Ms. Curran said, the uh, regulations that are in place within the state of Massachusetts are twenty thousand pots per trillion. Um, so anything under that uh, you're within regulation, and that's a combined total of all six of the chemicals that are regulated. Um, uh, EPA has a higher limit, uh, of, I believe it's 70,000 pots per trillion uh, for their limit, which is uh, nationwide. Uh, Massachusetts has the most stringent uh, restrictions within the United States currently at this time. Um, so the water department, we've tested for PFAS so far twice within our water system. Uh, following the state of Massachusetts standards for testing. Uh, we test both the raw water, uh, so water from the pond, and then also the finished water. So after the treatment process, as it's entering our system, uh, it's required for us to test it at both points. Uh, we did one test roughly about a year ago uh, that was underneath a uh, grant that was, uh, that was issued by DEP. Um, to any community that wanted to be part of their uh, initial testing round. Uh, and we've also had to do a second round of testing uh, as per the Massachusetts state standards. And there will be quarterly testing done uh, for these chemicals. Uh, all our tests have come back so far below the 20 parts per trillion. Uh, we've had uh, uh, 0.25 in uh, one of the PFAS substances, as well as a 0.24 uh, and one of the other ones in uh, the other four were non-detects or below the, uh, the minimum reporting limit required uh, by the state of Massachusetts. So knock on wood, uh, the city of Fall River right now, uh, we are in a good position. We feel that the, uh, that the numbers are low enough. Uh, they're well below the state limits and we feel that there is not any uh, impact or ha hazard to any of our customers. Um, you know, there are a lot of communities within the state of Massachusetts uh, that uh, that are dealing with this. Uh, I'm, you know, on a couple of different organizations uh, and you're speaking with other uh, community water systems uh, that are dealing with this issue. And it is uh, definitely a very uh, difficult issue that these water systems are having to deal with. Uh, a lot of the water systems that are uh, having this issue are groundwater systems. So those would be systems that have a well or a field of wells. They pump up, treat, or potentially go directly into storage and then go out to its customers. Uh, as uh, Board of Health, I'm sure, probably knows, our drinking water supply is a surface water supply. Uh, the North Wetupper Pond, about six to eight billion gallons. 
uh, and it's uh, protected with over 4,500 acres of, uh, of protected conservation land over on the, uh, on the east and north of the North Wetupper Pond. Uh, any runoff that comes from the city, uh, so anything that comes from the city side towards the North Wetupper Pond, uh, we have a two mile long interceptor drain uh, that runs along the shore of the North Wetupper Pond uh, on the western shore of the North Wetupper Pond uh, that protects any runoff from the city of entering the North Wetupper Pond. It takes and it conveys all of that runoff down into the South Wetupper Pond and then eventually would go out the Quickshin River to the uh, to the Taunton River. Uh, so our North Wetupper Pond is very well protected uh, against contaminants uh, being able to enter the pond. Um, you know, a search of communities within the area show that there are uh, that in our particular region there is not many uh, areas that are affected by PFAS. Uh, in Freetown, there was one small seasonal system uh, that did go above the limits uh, in their uh, <clears throat> protocols. They believe that the uh, PFAS was uh, entering their system through actually their piping after the wells. Um, the type of the style of piping that they were using, as well as uh, glue and connectors and Teflon tape um, from the testing that they did uh, they felt that that was the cause of it. They redid their piping and retesting brought them back below the uh, below the state limits. So it's not necessarily always within the actual drinking water supply. Uh, sometimes it can be within the system uh, where those P where those PFAS numbers uh, are gained from. The majority of our system after our drinking water supply after our drinking water treatment plant uh, is all. Uh, either cast iron or ductile iron water mains. Uh, we don't have uh, very much plastic, we don't have any plastic water uh, mains within our system. Uh, and we, the only plastic within our system is a, a polyethylene um, water services that feed from the main uh, into the house. So, um, you know, that's kind of a, a rundown of where we are within the city of Fall River in relation to the PFAS. Again, uh, there are some communities that are, uh, that are you know, needing to do extreme treatment processes um, or having to blend their water with other communities to uh, reach limits be below the 20 parts per trillion. Uh, luckily, we uh, are not in that case. Uh, we are below the limits uh, and in a, uh, in a good position right now. I don't know if the, uh, if the board has any overall questions in relation uh, to PFAS within the, the drinking water system. I'd be more than willing to answer. Again, any uh, questions, the, anybody? How, how would you treat it other than diluting the water? Uh, so dilution is one treatment. There's other talks of different types of treatment, uh, uh, activated charcoal treatment, um, different communities uh, currently, uh, uh, so different communities that have had, uh, you know, uh, results above the, the MLCs, uh, MCLs from the state. Um, some of them are, uh, there's point of treatment filters that can be added on. So filters within somebody's home. Uh, and essentially, those are primarily activated charcoal type filters um, that, uh, or green sand. Uh, filter that uh, that will filter these substances out, but they need to be changed pretty regularly because, uh, as uh, as Tess said, this is a forever chemical. Uh, it doesn't dilute. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. It has an extremely long half life. Uh, so it's not like something that uh, will just eventually, you know, uh, dilute itself out. You know, if uh, you're using some type of filter system, there's a point where the fifth filter system will become fully absorbed with this uh, with the PFAS and then it would need to the filters the media needs to be changed out. Okay. Um, so we don't have a problem at this time. We're we'll keeping nope. an eye on it. Yes. So we're going to be doing quarterly testing moving forward as per the state guidelines. Uh, we have uh, included that in this year's budget for 
uh, for a laboratory testing. Uh, What's the testing cost? Uh, the testing, I believe, was uh, roughly six hundred dollars per quarter. Okay, that's not so bad. Affordable. Yeah, just don't hold me exactly to that, but I believe that's what it came to this day. You know, I've always felt that uh, one of our city's strongest assets was his water is his water supply. I mean, our our uh, forefathers were very forward thinking in, in ensuring that we had a, an adequate supply that, that exceeds uh, most of the communities around here. I mean, they did it to support the mills, I imagine, but uh, uh, it was it was still pretty wise on their part. And, and we fluoridate our water, which is a, a, a strong benefit uh, that supporting the public health. And our sister city, New Bedford, doesn't do that. So we, we're fortunate in that regard too. So it's good to hear that we also don't have a problem uh, uh, in this regard with these chemicals. Yeah, so with, without a doubt, you know, this is this is becoming a very uh, emergent situation. You know, uh, some communities that are having this issue, uh, some communities are having, currently having to distribute bottled water to their residents, uh, other communities, uh, you know, and overall the treatment for this is, is not a cheap treatment systems that need to be installed. Um, you know, I've been hearing numbers anywhere from three to thirty million dollars that communities are going to have to spend uh, to upgrade their treatment system to deal with PFAS. Well, we don't have that problem. Correct. Okay. Any other questions for Paul or for Tess on this issue? I think we're good. Thank you, Paul. Yes, All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, board. Okay. Uh, is there any new business to come before the board of such a nature that it could not make the agenda when published? No, nope, no new business. Did we receive anything under citizens' input? We have not received anything under citizens' input. Okay. I guess the next thing is to confirm the date for the next meeting. Following our past. Procedure would be the fourth Thursday of the month, the 26th. Is that look okay? 26th of August? I have a conflict. Sorry. Okay. 19th of August. You want to go a week earlier or go into September? We can schedule in August a week earlier. And if there's any, anything to do, is if there's a matter before the board, we can do it. If not, we'll just uh, postpone it till September. That makes sense. Sounds good. So the 19th, August 19th, 4 p.m. Same on Zoom again. Works for me. Okay. Then can we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We got a second? Second. Can I have a roll call? Thomas Corey? Yes. Michael Coughlin? Yes. Stephen Gagliardi? Yes. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks. Bye. Thank